Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a quick bulletin here on the Angry Astronaut, updating you on the state of both Starship and Vulcan Centaur, as always. Not a lot of channels are doing this sort of thing as a race, but when it comes right down to it, it is an extremely important race. Now, I've had lots of people commenting saying that Vulcan Centaur and Starship really aren't in the same category, that Vulcan Centaur is nowhere near as important as Starship, so really doesn't even deserve to be in a race with it right now, but that just isn't true. Vulcan Centaur is just as important to the future of ULA as Starship is to the future of SpaceX. But not only that, there are many future missions being carried out by NASA and the U.S. Space Force and other extremely important companies besides that are very reliant on the Vulcan Centaur being successful. And of course, Starship is very much in the same boat. So why is this important to me? Well, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the 100K challenge, I have a bet going right now whereby if Starship manages to carry out a successful orbital test before Vulcan Centaur can successfully deliver its payload to the moon, that is to say the Peregrine Lander, I will tattoo a SpaceX fanboy on my ass. Oh yeah, and also I need to be at 100,000 subscribers, so subscribe! And when we're talking about a successful orbital test, Starship doesn't need to land. It just needs to orbit and then attempt a re-entry. I don't expect a landing. And then on the Vulcan side of things, as long as it successfully delivers Peregrine where it's supposed to be, if Peregrine fails to land, well, that's on Astrobotic, not really on, uh, on ULA. So as long as it successfully delivers its payload to where it's supposed to be, that's a success for ULA. So right now, it seems that Starship is very much in the lead and that I better find it, book an appointment, rather, with a tattoo parlor. But that's not the whole story. Yes, Starship will very likely at least attempt an orbital flight by the end of March, but Vulcan Centaur is also going to attempt its flight a little over 30 days later, and there are many, many factors that could allow ULA to successfully carry out its mission before SpaceX can complete theirs. This is the kind of moment that's likely to be repeated a number of times this year because there are so many next generation rockets attempting to make it to space from a variety of different countries. So many different rockets, all of which have been delayed for one reason or another, most cases for years beyond their intended launch dates, and now all of them are supposed to launch in 2023. This includes, of course, the H three rocket that you're looking at right now from Mitsubishi and JAXA, and also the Vulcan Centaur, of course, Starship naturally, and also the Ariane 6 from Ariane Spas and the European Space Agency. All of these rockets are incredibly important to the future of the space programs of their respective nations. Starship isn't the only game in town. Starship, of course, has a massive, colossal payload, and the future capability of transporting this payload anywhere in the solar system, but that's something that's unlikely to be realized anytime soon. For the next year or two, SpaceX is likely to try to master Starship's ability to travel to low Earth orbit and then to return to be reused. That alone is going to be an incredible challenge. Whereas at the same time, Vulcan Centaur, H3, and Ariane 6 are going to be carrying payloads substantially beyond low Earth orbit, something that Starship is really not going to be able to effectively do until they master low Earth orbit refueling or until they have a viable third stage for Starship. 
But how is this possible? How can it be that a rocket like Vulcan can outperform the largest rocket in human history to interplanetary destinations or even geosynchronous orbit? Once again, as I've said before, it comes down to Starship's weight. The orbiter is just so heavy, 100 tons worth of stainless steel, plus all the payload, plus 1,300 tons worth of fuel, it takes almost all of that just to attain low Earth orbit. Orbit. It can get to geosynchronous transfer orbit, GTO, but its capabilities drop off to 21 metric tons once it reaches GTO, and once again, that's not geosynchronous orbit. By way of comparison, Vulcan Centaur goes from 27.2 metric tons in low Earth orbit to 14.5 metric tons in geosynchronous transfer orbit, less than a 50% drop in capability versus an 80 percent drop in capability for Starship, meaning that by the time you get out to geosynchronous orbit, Starship has really run out of gas. Now, that doesn't mean that it's got a design flaw or that Vulcan's better or anything like that. Starship was designed to reach low Earth orbit and then to refuel there. It's just not very practical to use it in any other way unless it adds a third stage at some point. So what does this mean? Well, when it comes to payloads that have to be delivered directly to geosynchronous orbit, in other words, military payloads, rockets like Vulcan Centaur and Falcon Heavy are going to remain incredibly important. And Vulcan has advantages over Falcon Heavy when it comes to fairing size. SpaceX has yet to introduce an extended fairing for Falcon Heavy, meaning that Vulcan Centaur will remain a very important rocket for a variety of different payloads, including also the Sierra Space Dream Chaser. Dream Chaser simply cannot fly this year, at least under current circumstances, without Vulcan Centaur. So a number of companies, along with the U.S. military, relying very much on ULA and Vulcan to take them to space, which means these delays are not doing them any favors. And the mission, as far as Astrobotic is concerned, and the first American mission to land on the surface of the moon in over 50 years, well, that's incredibly important as well. This is a mission that now is confirmed to be carrying the DNA from four U.S. presidents, along with all kinds of important scientific payloads on the Peregrine as well, a total of 14 payloads to be precise being carried on this lunar taxi from Astrobotic, including a laser retro reflector array and navigation. Doppler LiDAR for precise velocity and range sensing, in other words, fine-tuning our ability to land on the surface of the moon, along with a variety of instruments designed to measure radiation levels on the surface of the moon as well, in order to determine what sort of dangers our astronauts are going to be facing on long-term missions during the Artemis program, a very important mission for NASA indeed, along with the other extremely important sentiments mental payloads that are going to be flying on this thing as well. This means, interestingly enough, that ULA cannot afford to have an anomaly on this mission. It's incredibly important that it goes off perfectly. Now, that may seem to be a very tall order for any launch provider to expect your first rocket to go off without a hitch. But guess what? The rocket upon which this one was based, that is to say the Atlas rocket, well, it's had quite a few changes over the years, and the last time Time Atlas experienced a complete failure was in 1993. Yes, 30 years ago. That's an accomplishment that actually no launch provider can match. Yes, Falcon 9 may have had more successful launches, but in terms of a long stretch of time over a number of changes of the rocket design, Atlas has been an unbelievably reliable and successful rocket. Now, this would suggest that SpaceX has an even bigger advantage given their history when it comes to launch aborts. Instead of waiting until the end of next month, the way that JAX is going to have to with the H3, should SpaceX experience some sort of abort associated with Starship, they're probably just going to hammer it all together and try to launch in the next day or two. That is their modus operandi. However, there's one important reason why SpaceX can't do things 
things that way anymore. By the way, that rather spectacular footage was shot by Matthew Travis, who's now the president of Aphelion Aerospace. At least I think that's how it's pronounced, and I'm actually going to investigate that company a little bit more thoroughly after watching this. But what's extremely important to note also, and most people haven't seen, is the fire that broke out in the aftermath of this massive explosion. And this is not going to be anything. It's going to be a mere firecracker compared to the potential explosion that Starship could produce. And let me give you some sobering figures here. The entire Antares rocket, including the fuel and everything else, weighs 260 metric tons. By way of comparison, the super heavy portion of Starship alone is 3,400 metric tons, and the Starship orbiter another 1,200 metric tons. 4,600 metric tons, or nearly 20 times the mass of Antares. That's a lot of flammable liquid. And even if only a small percentage of that goes up in an explosion, and by the way, only about 15% of the propellant on N1 actually exploded, well, the consequences are going to be a little difficult to imagine. So for this reason, SpaceX has to be every bit as careful as ULA is being right now. At the very least, they need to get Starship clear of the tower and at least a couple of kilometers up into the atmosphere to get it far enough away from the launch site and far enough away from all of the civilian observers in order to make sure that there isn't some kind of cataclysm. I have every confidence that SpaceX is going to be able to do this, but according to Gwyn Shotwell, as long as Starship manages to achieve that kind of altitude before it blows up, she regards that as a successful test. That's not a successful orbital test, just Starship being successful enough to get it clear of the tower and clear of Boca Chica so it doesn't cause any collateral damage. And even if Starship's explosion is nowhere near as powerful as I think it might be, the conflagration alone is going to be enough to incinerate that entire region. I think that the Boca Chica village will be very lucky to survive the resulting firestorm. So this is the sort of thing that could put SpaceX behind significantly. Even Elon Musk has admitted that a pad RUD would set the entire program back six months to a year. SpaceX needs to be very cautious, which means any sort of estimated launch date in March is dependent on a lot of things going right. And by the same token, any estimated date for Vulcan Centaur, which according to sources close to ULA, is now May 5th. No launch sooner than May 5th for Vulcan Centaur, or just a little bit more than 30 days after the estimated launch time frame for Starship, well, that could put Vulcan Centaur behind as well. There's a lot at stake right now. The chips are down, and who's going to be the one that makes it to space first, securing the future of their respective company? Well, we're going to find out in the next couple of months. Please smash that like, hit that subscribe, subscribe and also those notification bell buttons. Also, please check the description for various ways to support my content so I can cover not only the launch from Boca Chica, but the launch of Vulcan Centaur as well. And as always, stay angry about space.